I'm going to talk today about our research at Georgia Tech and specifically um, power cost efficiency currents. And the goal of my talk is to show how important multi-phase flow models are in studying these currents. And so pyroclastic density currents, to reduce some jargon, are basically particle Latin gravity currents generated from volcanic eruptions. So they're composed of hot gases and then a variation in um, particle sizes. And they propagate laterally away from the source due to their density being greater than the ambient surrounding fluid, which in our case is ambient air. And they're slightly different from other, other gravity currents in that they're actually very hot, so they're usually greater than 800 Kelvin, up to 1400 Kelvin. And they also can travel fairly fast, so anywhere from 10 meters per second up to 100 meters per second, so essentially 20 miles per hour up to 200 miles per hour. So the reason we want to study these currents is that they're the most dangerous local hazard to communities surrounding volcanoes. And so we want to understand how these flows propagate in the internal structure of these flows um, to mitigate hazards. And presently, we have no direct observations of those internal forces, the concentration of these particles, or the temperature of these flows. So to give you a little background on how volcanoes erupt, um, down in the subsurface, uh, you have a magma chamber. It's composed of a silica-based melt with dissolved volatiles, you get bubbles that grow and basically it brings the fluid or the melt up and you have fragmentation and that generates the energy to generate the eruption. And so within that eruption we have a variation in particle sizes anywhere from micro, micrometers up to meters in scale and then also hot gases. And from that we generate these pyroclastic density currents or these particle Latin gravity currents. And what's difficult with these eruptions is it's not safe for us or there's no way to measure some of those initial conditions. And also, so generally, as volcanologists, the way we try to understand these eruptions is we go and look at the actual deposits to infer some of those transport properties. And so my research is focused on a couple of volcanoes in Ecuador, specifically this volcano Tungarala in Ecuador. It's located in the central Andes. It's been erupting since 1999. And the figure on the right here is depicting some of the flows from a 2006 eruption. The areas in green are actually some of the surrounding communities. Um, and so the 2006 eruption actually overran a few of these communities and actually also killed a few people. So we want to understand how these uh, flows propagate. And then the other reason we study this volcano is it's well monitored. So we have some visual observations, some geophysical data, and we're able to look at the deposits and it's the perfect place to couple our multi-phase models to deposits to try to validate these models. And so to give you an, ac an example of what these eruptions look like and what as volcanologists we have to deal with is so we get some observations. These are actually uh, the density currents that I'm talking about. They travel down the flow fair, or down the flank of these volcanoes fairly efficiently, um, and you can see in the back. Basically, we have a buoyant portion of the column behind, and then the flows propagating in training and ambient air. Or those Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities. We also have some Loeb and cleft instabilities. Um, these currents usually travel about um, at this volcano about 10 to 20 meters per second. And so we have those visual observations, but we don't have any way to measure the internal structure of these currents. Um, as you can see, they're opaque, so we don't know what they look like on the inside. And then from those, we as volcanologists go look at the deposits. And so this is what we have to look at. And so this is actually that same canyon that that flow went down, and this is what the deposits that we look at. And so we go out and me measure grain size, volume fraction of these particles, um, but these flows depending on the flow regime, they can either sediment out or not sediment particles. And depending on that flow regime, you can get a deposit look like this. You can get a deposit where the flows have basically self-channelized. You can also get deposits with these larger class or particles that we call bread crust bombs, which I'll talk about a little later. And then again, these flows are um, can carry very large meter and scale 
um, particles kilometers away from the vent. So that's me for scale on how large these can be, these bombs can be. And so the way our group tries to study these and understand the dynamics of these currents is through multi-phase numerical models. So we want to try to quantify the internal workings of these currents and the forces. And specifically, we want to understand how the concentration of particles or how particles segregate in the, these flows, how dense these flows are. And we want to also see if we can model the entrainment of error, how that affects the dynamics of these currents, the runout distance of these currents. We also want to look at the, how the flows transform. So if they are originally more dense and then they transform to dilute. So we want to look at the influence of topography. So essentially we have the observation of what the flow looks like. In the top right on the bottom uh, left is what a deposit. And so we use multi-phase models to try to go to, from the in-between to look at the internal structure of these. And some of the computational challenges from these models is that we need to solve multiple scales of the flow. So we want to solve the heterogeneities of these currents. So we need to look at a scale from meter in size in scale up to kilometers. So these flows can travel anywhere from 10 to 30 kilometers. And so we want to model that. And then we have, again, multiple concentrations. So we have uh, dense part of the flows where particle particle interactions are important, and then we have more dilute, turbulent portions of these flows. And so we need large-scale 3D models to fully model these dynamics, and we also need to model the interaction with topography, because that can play a critical role in changing the dynamics of these currents and their hazards. So the way our group approaches this is we do multi-scale numerical models, um, typical continuum of or gas phases and particle phases, and we solve the conservation of mass, uh, energy, and momentum. And the particle and gas phases are coupled together through uh, heat exchange in the thermal energy equation, and then momentum exchange or drag between the particle and gas phases in the conservation of momentum equation. And then there's multiple other constitutive uh, equations that we solve. This model has been... Um, coupled or worked to form particularly for pyroclastic density currents. So to give you a few examples of what our models look like and what we're looking at, this is um, an area on Tungurawa. So if we zoom in, this is what the deposits look like when we're out in the field. So we go out and measure the size of these, the volume fraction of these particles. And then as we travel downslope across a river, we go look and we have a significant change in deposit characteristics. And so we want to see if we can model that flow transformation that matched what we see in the field to these models. And so we have a multi-phase model. Our, we have two isosurfaces I'm showing here. So in gray is the more dilute part of the current. And in the blue is you have a volume fraction of 10 to negative 2 particle, volume fraction particles. And so we can see is that as the flow encounters that topographic low or that river, you get the more dense part of the flow falling into the river, but the dilute, more turbulent portion of the flow is able to actually cross that river and deposit across the river in a more dilute regime, which is what we see also in the field. And then looking over in this area, um, which is the canyon that I showed the video of Tungarau erupting in February. And so again, we can model the same current going down. The colors are the same volume fraction. And you can see the entrainment of air or the increase in volume of especially the more dilute region, getting those Kelvin-Helmholtz instabilities, Loeb and cleft instabilities. And also, we can visualize how those particles segregate within that flow. And to give you an example, we also can model the temperature of those gases. So for these simulations, we start with uh, initial gas temperature of 800 Kelvin. And so the white and yellow surfaces are much cooler surfaces. So you can see that these currents are able to entrain ambient air fairly significantly. But the question is, how do we know if these models are correct? And so the way we compare is we look at deposit characteristics, visual observations. But we've also worked on developing another model. So as I told you before, there's these breadcrust bombs. They're uh, really unique. Uh, 
um, to certain volca uh, volcanic eruptions. And so they form, so when magma or when volcanoes erupt, you have the silica based melt that, and they erupt out hot and they have dissolved volatiles. And so um, those bubbles, uh, volatiles can grow um, when you nucleate. And so we've coupled this model, so we have a 2D or, or layering or layering Lagrangian, so we can track those particles through two different transport properties. So what we call projectile pyroclasts, which are those clasts that are ejected out of the volcano and transported mostly through ambient air, and then looking at the particles that are entrained in these pyroclastic density currents. And so the Lagrangian point, component of that model tracks those particles through the flow, their interaction with the current, and then we use just a 1D heat equation that we solve, and so we look at the cooling of these clasts, the radiative and convective heat transfer. And this is coupled to a viscosity model, so the viscosity of these particles will change depending on how cool, how cool the class are, their composition, which we know from other measurements in the field, and then also the loss of water, which occurs when you grow the bubbles. So we also couple this to a microscale bubble growth model where the bubbles are already nucleated, but we have a um, dissolved volatiles in this, and we look at how the bubbles grow, and we went, look at the interplay of cooling or the transport of these particles and how, if the temperature of these currents affects the formation of these brines or basically restricts bubbles from growing on the surface and then bubbles growing in the interior, and if we can see a change in morphology. And so what the results show is our vertical axis is that rind thickness um, or restriction of bubble growth. And then as we move left to right, we have enhanced air entrainment or essentially a cooler current that these particles travel through. And these are the projectile prior class, and the lower down are the PDC prior class. And so you can see that the projectiles don't, aren't really affected by entrainment of air, and again, that's because they travel mostly through ambient atmosphere. But the PDC pyroclast actually, as you entrain more air, you cool these currents more significantly, you actually get an increase in that rind thickness um, with cooler currents. And so from this, we've actually been able to create a regime diagram of how these class form, which previously hasn't been known. So through the numerical models, we're able to show that as you decrease your gas temperature or you have greater entrainment of air, you have a change in regime for these PDC pyroclasts, and essentially their rind uh, thickness increases. And we also get to look at some timing so we can maybe see when these class form. So this is a time scale of rind formation over transport. And so basically we see that these rinds are still forming once the, once the class are deposited, which previously previously hasn't been known, and also that for the projectiles, they're larger rinds, but that's also because the convective force or the convective cooling is more dominant. Um, so in conclusion, I hope I've shown that multiphase numerical models are very important for our study of pyroclastic density currents and the um, dynamics of those currents, and that we're able to solve complex multi-scale fluid dynamics with these models, and that through these models, we're able to match um, observe dynamics of these flows with deposit characteristics. And this gives us insight into how particles segregate in these flows, what controls the runout distance of these uh, currents, which is a large hazard. And that our model of breadcrust morphology, or basically that rind thickness, is um, a result of the transport as well as the thermal history of these flows. So we've created a numerical in situ thermometer that we'll use coupled to the flows and to match the deposits to better understand how these currents propagate. So with that, I'd like to thank the CSGF for their incredible support and all, all the opportunities, uh, the CSGF fellows for a great four years, as well as my volcanology group back at Georgia Tech. And with that, I'll take questions.